Welcome to your cardiac surgery preview. I'm Mark Sowers. Now, as I mentioned in the last lecture, I love this stuff. I love talking about the physiology of the heart and the lungs. So I'm going to go on a little bit longer than I normally do this time. So again, down here at the bottom, you can turn it up to 1.25 speed and sort of speed through it if you don't want to hear all the details. So let's begin with some of the cardiac anatomy, the heart anatomy. Now we sort of automatically know where the heart is in the chest, at least when looking face on. It's sort of below the sternum and maybe off to the left a little bit. But when you're looking at this body from the side, you see a different perspective. You can see here that it's at the bottom of the thoracic cavity. So that's the purple area that you see here, the thoracic cavity, right above the diaphragm. The diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So the heart sits right at the bottom of this cavity and right on top of the diaphragm. And it sits at the front, the anterior portion of this cavity. And just like other organs that we talked about, the organs in the abdominal cavity are surrounded by a serous membrane and the wall is covered with a peritoneum. That's that very slippery membrane that allows the organs to slide back and forth against each other. And the lungs have the pleura, which is again that serous membrane that allows them to slide back and forth. Well, the heart has the same thing, and this time it's called the pericardium. So there is a visceral pericardium attached to the heart itself and a parietal pericardium on the outside attached to the chest walls and other things. And the heart, probably more than any other organ, really needs the slippery membrane because the heart is beating constantly. It's constantly in motion and it needs something nice and smooth to slide against so it doesn't get roughed up or stuck on anything as it's moving around. Now, I know you've heard about the anatomy of the heart before, but we're going to go over it again because it will appear on the test and it probably will appear on the national boards in some form. So we're going to go over it again. We have the four chambers of the heart. At the top, we have the atria. So we have the right atrium and the left atrium. And down at the bottom, we have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And connecting these chambers, we have valves. Now let's discuss valves for a minute because they're different than sphincters, which we have mostly in the digestive system. Now a sphincter is a muscle that's going to squeeze down or open up to allow fluid to pass through. So it's a muscle and it can control whether or not fluid passes through. A valve is different. A valve can't control how much fluid can go through. All a valve can do is control the direction that the fluid flows. So with valves, fluid can only flow in one direction. So what will happen is you have the two flaps of the valve, and as long as fluid is flowing in one direction, it flows through there just fine. There's no control, there's no constricting to limit that flow. It just flows right through. But if the fluid decides it wants to go the other way, what will happen is that it will get around the back side of each of these flaps and push, and which pushes them together, pushes them closed. So with valves, there's no muscle that opens and closes them. They just open and close naturally depending on the way the fluid is flowing. As long as it's flowing this way, the valve stays nice and open. Once the fluid tries to go this way, it's going to get behind these flaps on the valve and force that valve shut, blocking the fluid from going this way. So the names of these valves are important. We have the semilunar valves. These are the two valves that lead out of the heart. So we have the pulmonary semilunar valve, and this is the valve that leads to the lungs, the pulmonary, the lungs. We also have the aortic semilunar valve. This is the valve that leads into the aorta. And these are two smaller valves. The two bigger valves are between the atrium and the ventricle. So we have the tricuspid valve between the right atria and the right ventricle. And we have the bicuspid valve, which is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And again, knowing the names of these valves, also very important. So let's take a little closer look at these valves just to get an understanding of what's going on. You have the aortic and pulmonary valves down here at the bottom. That leads out of the heart, so that's where the blood leaves the heart. And then between the atrium and the ventricles, you have the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. Tricuspid, because as you can see here, there are three flaps to that, so tricuspid. And bicuspid, you can see here, because there are only two flaps to it. So the two flaps open and closed come together. Now, the bicuspid valve is also often called the mitral valve. You are going to hear that term, the mitral valve. And the reason it gets that name is because it's named after a mitre. 
Now, a mitre is a tall hat that's worn by bishops, usually in the Catholic Church. So it has these two points on it, these two flaps on the top of this hat. And the mitral valve looks very similar to that. It has these two flaps, and these two flaps open and close, open and close, to let the blood flow through or to block the blood from going the wrong way. So that's where the name mitral comes from. It comes from a mitre hat, which looks like the mitral valve. Now, another important thing to know is how the blood flows through the heart and really understanding the path that it takes. So let's go through it here. The blood enters the heart from the superior and inferior vena cavas. That's, those are the big veins that bring the blood to the heart. And from there, it enters the right atrium. You see it's shaded blue here to indicate that this is deoxygenated blood. This is blood that's returning from the body. The body's already used the oxygen, so the blood color is actually a little bluer than oxygenated blood, so it's shown as blue here. So the right atrium is where the blood enters the heart for the first time in the cycle. It goes in through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle down here at the bottom. From there, when the right ventricle squeezes, it squeezes the blood up through the pulmonary valve. That's the valve that then opens, letting the blood out. And because it's the pulmonary artery, it's going to lead the blood away from the heart to the lungs. So the pulmonary artery, even though it's blue, don't let the colors confuse you here, it's deoxygenated blood flowing through an artery, an artery because it's leading away from the heart. And this is the pulmonary artery leading to the lungs. Once the blood passes through the lungs and becomes oxygenated, as we talked about last time, it then enters the heart through the pulmonary veins. Now, again, the pulmonary veins are red here. Why? Because the blood is now oxygenated as it enters the heart, and veins are what enter the heart. So that's why it's backwards from what you normally think. But now we have oxygenated blood entering the heart through the pulmonary veins. And where it does is it enters through the left atrium. And you can see the four little holes here because there's four little pulmonary veins that sort of lead in to the left atrium. From there, the left atrium pumps the blood through the mitral valve, the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is the largest, that has the biggest muscle of the heart. So of all the heart chambers, the left ventricle has that biggest muscle because it's going to be sending the blood to the rest of the body. So when that left ventricle squeezes down, it's really putting a lot of blood pressure. It's putting a lot of pressure on that blood, sending it into the aorta and out to the rest of the body. And one cool thing about the heart is you can actually hear it functioning. You can hear heart sounds. If you put your ear up to somebody's chest or if you use a stethoscope, you can hear lub dub lub dub lub dub so what you're hearing are the valves of the heart and you're hearing them slam shut so when the tricuspid and bicuspid valves slam shut they make a lub sound and then a very short time later after the ventricles finish contracting the pulmonary valve and the aortic valves slam shut and that makes a dub sound so you hear lub dub lub dub lub dub as the tricuspid and bicuspid valves slam shut followed very shortly after by the pulmonary and aortic valves. So ejection fraction is an important concept to know and what we're talking about here is specifically the left ventricle, that big muscle that pumps the blood out to the rest of the body. So we're talking about the amount of blood or the fraction of the blood that it has that it's able to pump out. So imagine you have the chamber of the left ventricle, okay, and it's holding some blood in there. Let's say it's holding 10 ounces of blood, let's say. And when it squeezes down, it's able to pump out seven of those 10 ounces, and three of those are going to remain here in the heart chamber, okay? It's because it can't squeeze it all the way down, so it, but it can squeeze a pretty good amount. So seven out of the 10 ounces are squeezed out into the aorta. That's an ejection fraction of 70%. It's squeezing out 70% of the blood out of that chamber. And 70% is a fairly typical number, but knowing this gives a good idea of how well the heart is functioning. For example, let's say there's a problem with the mitral valve, the valve leading into the ventricle. So let's say instead of those valve parts closing nice and tight, let's say they don't close nice and tight. Let's say they sort of miss a little bit and there's a little gap. And when the ventricle squeezes down, some of the blood actually goes backwards through this valve. Now the valve's supposed to stop that, but if they don't quite meet, some of that blood's going to go back out. So that means of all the blood that the ventricle is trying to squeeze, some of it's not going into the aorta where it's supposed to go. It's going somewhere else. So the ejection fraction in that case is going to be much lower. 
Like most tissues and most organs, the heart wall is made up of three layers. We have the endocardium, the endo meaning in, so that's the inner surface of the cardiac wall. Most of the cardiac wall is the muscle, so this is the myocardium, myo meaning muscle, so that's the nice thick part right there, lots and lots of muscle cells in there. And on the outside, we have the epicardium, or also called the pericardium, or again, remember that very slippery surface, the pericardium, the visceral pericardium, which allows it to slide around. And heart muscle cells, I think, are really, really fascinating by the way they work. All right, now don't let this graphic scare you. It's actually pretty easy to understand. I'll show you what's going on. What we're looking at here is a cardiac cell wall that separates the outside of that cardiac muscle cell from the inside. And all along this cell wall, you have these little pumps. And these pumps are running constantly. And what these pumps are doing, doesn't matter whether the heart's beating or it's resting or it's beating or it's resting, they're, these pumps are just always running. What they're doing is they're taking sodium from outside and pumping it in, and they're taking calcium from outside, pumping it in, and they're taking potassium from inside and pumping it out. And they're just always doing this. Oh, here comes the sodium. We're going to pump it in. Here comes the calcium. We're going to pump it in. Just constantly, constantly running. But these ions, these sodium, potassium, calcium ions, contain a charge. So what happens is as you pump these ions back and forth, you're going to build up a difference of electrical charge between the outside and the inside of the cell. And as the pumps keep running, that charge builds up more and more and more until, as you know what happens, when you get a really strong electrical charge, you're going to get a little spark. You're going to get a little jolt. And that's what happens. That muscle cell is suddenly going to contract. It's going to equalize all those ions, and the pumps just continue to pump, continue to pump. So I think of cardiac cells kind of like a giant water bucket. Now, near where I live, we have this really cool water park. And it's got this giant volcano-looking thing. It's really just a giant bucket up there. And there's a pump that pumps water into this bucket. And it's just constantly pumping. No matter what's going on, it's just constantly pumping water into this bucket. And what happens is this giant bucket, it fills up and fills up and it fills up slowly until it gets to a certain level. And when it gets to that certain level, all of a sudden it gets top heavy and it tips over and the water pours out and the kids yell and scream and they have a blast. Okay. And then the bucket tips back up and the water keeps pouring in and it keeps pumping it back in again until it gets full and it tips over again. Well, that process is exactly what's happening in cardiac cells. The cells are constantly pumping ions in, constantly pumping ions out, building up that charge, building it up, building it up, until it reaches a tipping point, until that bucket gets full, at which point the bucket tips over, and that's when the muscle contracts, and that's when the heart beats. And you have cell after cell after cell. You have lots and lots of these muscle cells in there all doing the same thing. So what happens is they're all sort of filling up and sort of filling up. And what happens is one cell is going to get it to its tipping point first. And that cell is going to tip over. And what happens when a bucket that's almost full gets bumped by a bucket that's already full and starting to tip over? Well, then it's going to tip over. And it's going to knock its neighbor. It's going to tip it over. And it's going to knock its neighbor and tip it over. So it creates this chain reaction. And as long as all those buckets are almost most full, it's going to go one boom, 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 like a set of dominoes all the way across the heart. And once that first bucket tips, it knocks the next one and the next one. And that wave travels so quickly through those heart muscles that essentially they all happen at the same time. It's not precisely the same time. It's a wave that moves through there, but it's so fast that it's essentially the same moment and that all those muscles cells contract at the same time, pumping the blood. So let's look at how those waves of contraction move through the heart. They actually start up in the right atrium in an area known as the sinoatrial node. Now this is important because this little nugget here, this little node in the wall of the right atrium is special. And what makes it special is because the buckets, compared to all the rest of the buckets of the heart, the buckets in this spot are just a little bit smaller. So what happens is that these buckets are going to fill up, because they're smaller, they're going to fill up just a little bit faster than all the other cells. And what happens is it's going to tip over, and it's going to bump its neighbor, and it's going to bump its neighbor, and these guys are almost full, so as soon as they get bumped, they're going to fall over as well, and that wave is going to spread through the heart. So it starts at the sinoatrial node, because the buckets are just a little bit smaller, they're going to fill up just a little bit faster there, and that's where that wave is almost always going to start in the heart. 
Now from that point, again, that wave spreads out all the way across the atrium, all the way into the left atrium as well, and both atria just sort of compress and contract essentially at the same moment. But as that wave travels around, it suddenly hits a wall, and there is a wall between the atria and the ventricles, and that wave can't make it through. It's blocked at that wall. So the wave comes around the atria, squeezes everything there, hits this wall, and it comes to a stop, except for one point right in the middle. This is the AV node, the atrial ventricle node. This is one little hole, one little point where that wave is able to travel through that wall, and it travels through some special conduits known as the bundle of Hiss and the right and left bundle branches. And what happens is that wave continues down these branches, down these channels, these special channels that allow the dominoes to fall one after the other through this channel, and it goes slowly through this channel. It slows that wave down just enough for the atrium to finish their contracting. They want these atria to finish contracting completely and start to relax before the ventricles go. So this wave, as it travels through these channels, are slowed down, slowed down a little bit until that wave reaches the bottom of the heart. Now, the bottom of the heart is known as the apex. I know it's kind of backwards. Usually you think of the apex at the top, but an apex actually meets the point, the point of the A, only this way the heart is sort of, you know, upside down a little bit. So the apex of the heart is down at the bottom. So that wave, those dominoes are going to fall all the way down through the channels, down to the bottom of the heart, the apex of the heart. And then from there, it's going to go into the heart muscle in the ventricles, and it's going to squeeze upward. And this is important. You want the squeezing to begin down here at the bottom and squeeze that blood upward. Why? Because this is where the out is. This is where the valves are. So you want to push the blood in that direction. You don't want to squeeze from the top and all of a sudden you're pushing blood this way and it has nowhere to go. It's going to be trapped. So the reason these waves bring it all the way down to the apex is because you want that squeezing to begin at the bottom of the heart and squeeze it up towards the top, pushing the blood out through the valves at the top. Now, the really cool thing about this system is that nowhere did I mention the brain or nerves. That's because the heart acts almost completely independently from the brain. That trigger that starts the heartbeat, that starts that first wave, has nothing to do with nerves. It has to do with those buckets filling up. And the first bucket to fill up and tip over starts the wave across the system. So what does that mean? Well, that means the heart doesn't have to be connected to any nerves. In fact, that scene from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, a movie a long time ago, I know, okay? That scene where the guy sticks his hand into somebody's chest and pulls out the heart and the heart's still beating in his hand. It's not connected to anything, but it's still beating. That's because as long as those buckets keep getting filled up, they're going to keep tipping over and keep that wave going. It doesn't have to be connected to any nerves. In fact, there have been many experiments where scientists have taken a heart and placed it in a bowl of nutrient solution, and the heart just keeps on beating. It's not connected to anything, but as long as there's nutrients there, as long as there's ions feeding the heart... As long as those little pumps in the heart cell walls keep pumping, those buckets are going to keep on tipping and keep on tipping forever. That's kind of cool. So what does the brain control? Because there are nerves that lead from the brain to the heart, but it doesn't trigger the heartbeat. All the brain can do is speed up the heartbeat or slow it down. And it does that through these special nerves. And essentially what these nerves do is they can control the size of the buckets. So the accelerator nerve, which accelerates the heart, it's going to make the buckets in the SA node a little bit smaller. And if the buckets are a little bit smaller, they're going to fill up a little bit faster. And that means they're going to tip over a little bit faster. So instead of, you know, the regular size buckets, it's going to go beat, beat, beat. If this bucket's smaller, it's going to go beat, 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 because the buckets are filling up faster, they tip over faster, and they start that beat a little bit faster. The vagus nerve does the opposite. What the vagus nerve does is it makes those buckets a little bigger, which means it's going to take it a little bit longer to fill up, so it's going to slow the beats down. It takes longer to fill it up, so the time between beats is a little bit longer, and the beats go beat, beat, beat. It's slower when the vagus nerve is active. So let's review a few terms that you'll see in cardiac surgery. 
the electrocardiograph or ECG, or in some places EKG cardiograph, okay? So the electrocardiograph is a graph, is a way of measuring the electrical impulses in the heart as it beats. So again, those muscles as they tip one bucket to the next create a little electrical impulse, and we can see that by the little electrodes that we place on the patient's skin, and we get a little graph, and you can see the little line bouncing along. That's an ECG or an electrocardiograph or sometimes an EKG. And this is what one of those graphs normally looks like. This is the normal sinus rhythm. Sinus means a wave that is in a regular pattern. It's just a steady pattern, just like you see here, a nice little beat followed by a space and then a beat and then a space and they're regular beats. Now bradycardia, brady in this case means slow. So you have a beat and then you have a long wait until the next beat. And that's bradycardia. So slow beats, a low heart rate is bradycardia. And of course, the opposite of that would be tachycardia. And in this case, you can see beat, 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 beat a whole bunch of them very quickly. So tachycardia is a very rapid or fast heartbeat. Now, sometimes the heart can go into a pattern called fibrillation. Now, what fibrillation is, is remember all those buckets. They're all lined up. They're all getting pretty full, and they're just about ready to tip over. One triggers, and it all goes through the next. Well, with fibrillation, all those buckets are at different levels. So this bucket might tip, but this bucket isn't ready to go yet, so it's sort of blocked. Instead, the wave goes this way and tips this bucket, and then it comes around and finally gets to this bucket, and everything sort of gets out of sync. All the buckets are filling at different times. They're not synced up. So instead of all the muscle cells squeezing concurrently all at once, what will happen is this muscle cell will squeeze, then this one over here, then this one over here, and the heart sort of wiggles a little bit. It sort of does this, and they're not coordinated. They're not working as a team. Now, if the atria goes into this pattern where the muscle cells are just sort of wiggling all over the place and not really squeezing, that's kind of bad, but it's not really bad because what will happen is every time the wave goes past the AV node, and it might be at irregular intervals, but at least every once in a while it is going to go past that AV node, it's going to send a signal down to the ventricles, and they're going to still stay in a nice, neat pattern. Everything's coordinated, and they're still going to squeeze pumping the blood out to the rest of the body. And as long as the ventricles are nice and coordinated, everything's all going to be okay. It's not great if the atria is doing this because the heart's not working as well as it should, but at least the person's going to survive. In fact, people survive for years with atrial fibrillation, where the atria are just sort of doing this all the time and not really beating. As long as the ventricles are beating, they're going to be okay. But when the ventricles start to do this, that's more of a problem because it's the ventricles that pump that blood out into the body. And if the ventricles start doing this, they're not pushing the blood in some coordinated fashion in order to get it out to the rest of the body. So the ejection fraction, which was like 70%, suddenly with this little wiggling, it goes down to like 10% or even less. And suddenly we have no blood flow. And that's a very dangerous situation that we need to take care of very quickly. And you know how we do this. We get the paddles out and clear shock, and it shocks the heart back into rhythm. So what's happening here? Well, when we shock the heart, we send an electrical current all the way through all the muscle cells. And what we do is we empty all of the buckets, all the buckets. Each muscle cell is its own bucket, and we empty all the buckets flat to nothing. That's what that shock wave does. It empties them. And then all the muscle cells start to fill up at the exact same time. And when that one cell finally does tip over, they all are ready to go and they all squeeze in sync. So shocking the heart levels everything to zero, they all fill up at the same rate, and then they're all ready to go when that first beat comes through. But the key to this is that the little pumps in those muscle cells continue to pump. And it does, as long as you empty the buckets and they're still pumping, they're all gonna fill up. But if something happens that turns off the power to those pumps, now you have a bigger problem. So let's say the blood flow to those cardiac muscles is cut off and there's no more oxygen coming in. Well, suddenly there's no more energy to run the pumps that keep those ions pumping in and out. And the pumps themselves stop flowing. And if those pumps stop running, that means the heart stops beating and you get a flat line, just like you see here. And a flat line is known as asystole. That means this not beating at all because the pumps aren't running. And that means that this pattern, the flat line pattern, despite what you see on every single TV show and every single movie, the flat line pattern is not a shockable pattern. Now, why is that? 
You cannot shock somebody back to life if they have asystole, if they're flatlined. Because what's going on here is the pumps have stopped filling those buckets. So you can shock it. You can empty those buckets down to zero, and that's what shocking the heart does. It empties those buckets. But if the pumps aren't running, the buckets are never going to fill back up. So asystole, a flatline, is a non-shockable pattern. You're not going to be able to fix this condition with a shock. Now, as I mentioned before, the muscle around the left ventricle is the biggest. It's the strongest muscle of the four chambers. But sometimes patients can have a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy, myo, we're talking about the muscle. And in this case, hypertrophic. Hyper means a lot of or big. So we've got a really big muscle in the left ventricle. Now, usually it's pretty big, but in this case, it's really big. Those muscle walls are really, really thick. Now, you say, okay, that sounds good, except if the muscle walls are really thick, that means the space, the chamber in between, is kind of small because the muscle walls have taken up all that space. So even though the muscle walls are able to squeeze really hard, there's not very much blood in the chamber to squeeze out. And because there's not very much blood in the chamber, there's not going to be very much blood pumped out into the system. So the patient's going to have a lower blood flow than normal, and that's going to make them feel weak and tired. Unfortunately, there is no surgery that can cure this condition. This is an incurable condition. And with all this pumping and valves and everything going on in the heart, as you can imagine the blood pressure is going to be different at different times of the cycle in different places in the heart. And we can go in and measure these differences in blood pressure all the way around the heart by using something called a Swans-Gans catheter. Now, this catheter has a little balloon on it, and we feed it in through the heart, and we'll go to different places, especially, say, the pulmonary artery, and we'll inflate that balloon, blocking off one of the pulmonary arteries. So as we block this pulmonary artery, let's see how it affects blood pressure. Then we're going to block this pulmonary artery. Let's see how it affects blood pressure. And from there, we can find problems in the circulation system around the heart. So a Swans-Gans catheter allows us to measure different blood pressures at different places around the heart. An echocardiograph is an ultrasound. Now, this sounds very similar to electrocardiograph, but it's different. This is an echocardiograph, and think of echo, that's a sound. So we're dealing with an ultrasound here. In this case, we're using sound waves to get a picture of the heart. We're looking at the heart, we're seeing the muscles of the heart, we're seeing the different chambers, we're seeing the valves move in the heart, we can see them move and how they function, and we can actually use a little Doppler sensor that can tell the blood flow in which direction the blood is flowing and where it's flowing. So that's an echocardiograph. So now that we understand a lot of the anatomy, let's take a look at some of the surgeries that you might see in a cardiac room. Now, probably the most well-known surgery is going to be cardiac bypass surgery. And in this case, we're talking about very specifically coronary artery bypass with grafting. And we shorten that to C-A-B-G, pronounced cabbage. So a cabbage is coronary artery bypass with grafting. And here's what we're doing. We're finding the coronary arteries. Now, the coronary arteries are the arteries that feed the heart muscle. And we have to feed the heart muscle because the heart muscle isn't able to get oxygen from the chambers of the heart. That heart muscle is too thick. It's too thick for that oxygen to flow through. So we actually have to have arteries and capillaries that bring oxygen to every single one of those heart muscle cells in there. And it's the coronary arteries that do this. They're the ones that bring that blood to the heart muscles to keep feeding them. And of course, these coronary arteries have all different names. There's the right coronary artery and the left main coronary artery and the circumflex coronary artery and then the left anterior descending artery. Now, the left anterior descending artery or the LAD, the LAD artery, is a common artery that happens to get plaque in it and happens to get a buildup and happens to get cut off. That's where blood flow gets cut off. And when that happens, all the muscle downstream from that blockage doesn't get any more oxygen, and it can die. And that is a heart attack. When heart muscle, cardiac muscle, dies because it doesn't get enough oxygen, that's a heart attack. So one of the very first lines of treatment, one of the first things we try to do if somebody's having a heart attack, is we try to do a cardiac catheterization. Now, in this case, we're going to insert a catheter, usually through the arteries in the legs near the groin area, and run it up through the aorta and into the coronary arteries that feed the heart. 
And from there, we inject a little bit of dye so we can see those blood vessels and see if there are any strictures or narrowing of those blood vessels. And if that blood vessel is extremely narrow or closed completely, we're going to have to go in and do something about that. And one way to fix this is through bypass surgery. And here you can see some examples of some bypass surgeries. We have single, double, triple, or even quadruple bypass surgeries. And what we're doing is we're bypassing one, two, three, or four of the main coronary arteries that feed the heart. And by bypassing, what we're doing is we have that narrowing or blockage of the coronary artery. So we're going to take another vessel and connect it up here and bring the blood around, connect it past that blockage, and let the blood flow back into that artery downstream of that blockage, feeding the muscle downstream. And by using a vessel from somewhere else in the body, or by using an artificial vessel, we can anastomose that to these two different points and create a bypass around that blockage. So one of the vessels that we can graft into the heart to bypass the blockage is going to be the saphenous vein. We can go in and harvest the saphenous vein from the patient's own leg, bring it up to the heart, graft it into place, and allow the blood to flow around and bypass that blockage. Another common vessel that we use is the internal mammary artery. and We'll just disconnect that from where it was otherwise going, bring it down, and connect it to the coronary artery. So when we graft a blood vessel onto the aorta, we make a little incision, a little hole, and then suture the new blood vessel into place. Well, do you see a problem with that? If the heart's still beating, and sometimes we do these surgeries while the heart is still beating, there's still blood flowing through that aorta. There's still a lot of blood pressure in that aorta. So if we make a hole in the aorta, guess what's going to happen? Well, we're going to have a mess. We're going to have blood squirting all over the place. So we need to use a little trick to get around that. And that trick is a Statinsky clamp. Now, this is kind of a cool clamp. It's kind of a, like a long debakey, and it's got these cool little curves on it. Now, what we're doing here, we're not clamping off the entire aorta to block the blood flow so it doesn't flow out, okay? And that would be bad because blood isn't flowing to the rest of the body either. So a Statinsky clamp allows us to clamp the side of the aorta. And with just the side of the aorta clamped, blood can still flow through the main channel of the aorta. It's just this little pocket that's completely cut off from the rest of the aorta. So now if we go in there and make a little incision, a little hole, all we're going to get is a couple of drops of blood that happen to be caught in that area, but it's not going to flow through there because the clamp is blocking the rest of that area off. I think that's kind of cool. Now often to make this little hole that we need, we're going to use something called an aortic punch, which is a little punch that makes a nice little round hole into the aorta. And restoring blood flow to these coronary arteries is a great thing. The patient feels a lot better afterwards. But getting these surgeries scheduled often takes a little time, and you don't want the heart muscle to die any more than it already has. So as a stopgap measure, we can use something called an intraaortic balloon pump. Now, this is a pretty cool system, but it takes a moment to figure out exactly what's going on here. All right, what we're doing is we're inserting a catheter, again, probably up through the leg and into the aorta, and we're inserting this balloon. And we're going to inflate and deflate this balloon every time the heart beats. And what this is doing is it's blocking and unblocking the aorta. It's not pumping blood so much, so you know, calling it a pump is a little weird and a little confusing. It's not really pumping the blood. All it's doing is blocking and unblocking the aorta every time the heart beats. So what good does that do? Well, inflating the balloon blocks the aorta, which creates high blood pressure up here at the top of the aorta. It creates lower blood pressure down below, but it creates high blood pressure up here at the top of the aorta. And that's what we're going for, at least briefly, until we deflate the balloon and let the blood flow. But at least for a little bit of time, we have real high blood pressure up here at the aorta. The heart beats, it pumps the blood, but the blood can't follow the aorta where it normally would. So you build up that real high blood pressure right here at the top of the aorta. Aorta. Now, what does that do? Well, let's look at the arteries leading out of the aorta. Here's a trick question. What's the first artery leading out of the aorta? The very first one that the blood comes to, the first little branch off of the aorta. No, it's not this guy up here. That's the brachiocephalic artery. That's not the first one. The first one is actually right down here, right after the valve itself, right after the aortic valve. You have these blood vessels coming off of here. 
Those are the coronary arteries. In other words, the very first thing that the heart feeds is itself. It takes care of itself first through those coronary arteries, and then it sends the blood elsewhere. So the very first arteries leading off of the aorta are the coronary arteries. So if we have a blockage in one of those coronary arteries where the blood vessel is real, real narrow and blood's having a hard time getting through, we're going to use this balloon to increase the pressure in the aortic arch, which is going to put more pressure into the coronary arteries. It's going to squirt that blood through that blockage a little bit more than it otherwise would. And that is going to feed the heart muscle, at least temporarily, until we can get in there and repair it. So every time this balloon inflates, it increases the blood pressure in the aortic arch, which feeds the heart muscle, and then the balloon deflates, letting the blood go to the rest of the body. And each heartbeat, it inflates and deflates, temporarily increasing that blood pressure right around the coronary arteries. Now, if the damage to the heart muscle is too great that the ventricle just can't contract anymore because so much of that heart muscle has died, we will have to install something called a ventricular assist device. And what this is, is essentially a little pump that we put in the patient's chest and it takes blood out of the ventricle, pumps it through this pipe and into the aorta. So it's replacing the ventricle. The ventricle is just not squeezing anymore. So this pump is taking the blood from the ventricle and pumping it into the aorta. And while these pumps can help keep the patient alive for a little while, ideally we want to get the patient a new heart. And that's when we're going to do a complete heart transplant. And as you're probably aware, this is a very long procedure. It involves opening the chest cavity up and taking the old heart out and putting a new heart in, making all the connections. Now, at this point, the heart can't be beating. So we need to keep the patient alive during the surgery. And we'll do that using a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. We'll take the blood and instead of sending it through the heart and lungs, we're going to run it through this machine that's going to oxygenate the blood and pump it back into the body. And the plumbing connections you can sort of see here. We take blood from the superior and inferior vena cavas. We pull it out of there before it reaches the heart, send it through the machine, and pump it back into the aorta where it goes back out to the rest of the body. Now notice what's happening here. We're oxygenating the blood in this machine, which means we're bypassing the heart and the lungs completely. The blood isn't going into the heart. It's not going through the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins to the lungs. It's bypassing all of that. So we're sending it through this machine from the vena cava, through the machine, into the aorta, and back into the body. And the way these pipes are temporarily connected to these blood vessels is using the purse string suture technique, which is suturing around the hole. And then once you get the pipe in there, you're going to cinch that nice and tight, and it's going to create that seal around the pipe. But even with the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, this is going to be rough on the patient. And we want to try to protect the patient as much as we can. So one thing we can do is induce hypothermia. We're going to cool the patient down. Now, the reason we're going to do this is because when the patient's nice and cold, their body is using less energy, their cells are using less energy, which means they're using less oxygen, which means that there, if there is any lack or stoppage of oxygen, even for a brief period of time, the cells will probably survive that because they're using less of the oxygen that they currently have. So hypothermia is a way of protecting the body until we can get the plumbing system functioning again. After a big operation like this that goes through the sternum, we're going to have to then close the sternum. One way of doing it is using these plates like we do on other bones. We'll put the plates on here and sort of screw into the bone. But another way of doing it is using stainless steel wire. Well, we'll wrap the stainless steel wire around the sternum and when we bring it together. We'll wrap the wire around and sort of twist tight together and that's going to hold the sternum together until it heals. A common heart problem is a problem with the valves, and the mitral valve, that big valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, is a common place for problems to occur. If the patient has a really bad case of strep throat, yeah, ordinary strep throat, if they get a really bad case of that, that can turn into rheumatic fever. And one of the places that it causes damage is the mitral valve. It causes scarring, and that mitral valve can often heal together. So a chronic rheumatic fever infection can lead to a scarring over or a sealing of that mitral valve. So it doesn't open very much anymore, and the blood doesn't flow out of the heart very well anymore, and the ejection fraction goes way down. So to repair this, we're going to have to do a procedure called a commissurotomy. 
Now this is probably a new word. Again, otomy, we know what that is. O, oh, so we're making a hole. And we're making a hole in the commissure. Now what's a commissure? All right, so a commissure is a place where one thing joins another different thing. And in this case, we're talking about the atrium and the ventricle. And where they join together is a commissure. So a commissurotomy is going to be opening that point where the atrium and the ventricle join together. In other words, the mitral valve. Now, if the opposite problem happens, where the mitral valve doesn't close, it just stays open for any number of reasons, we'll have to do a mitral valve replacement. And there are several types of valves that we could use. There are actually mechanical valves, metal valves, where the valves sort of flap open and close. So we can replace it with a mechanical valve, or we can replace it with a biological valve. Usually what we're going to use is a bovine or even a porcine, meaning a valve from a cow or pig heart that we've cleaned up and made into this new valve that we're able to implant into the patient. And these replacement valves will usually last about 10 or 15 years or so before they have to be replaced again. Now, it used to be that we have to do open heart surgery in order to replace one of these valves. We'd have to open the heart up, cut around the old valve, suture in the new valve, and close everything together. That was a huge procedure. But there's a new way of doing it that you're going to hear a lot about, and this is a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or a TAVR, T-A-V-R. And this is pretty cool. We're doing it transcatheter. We're using a catheter to replace this valve. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a little incision down in the leg, in the groin area, insert the catheter up the aorta and around. We're going to shove this new valve into the old valve. So the old valve is sort of here, it's sort of flopping around a little bit. We're going to shove the new valve in, just push the old one out of the way. We're not cutting out, we're just pushing it out of the way. We're going to insert this new valve in there, open it up, and it instantly starts to work. And that's kind of cool, which means instantly blood is flowing much better than it was before in the patient. Even if they're awake during this procedure, they're going to instantly feel a whole lot better. Another type of open heart surgery that we might do is an ASD or a VSD. We're talking about an atrial septal defect or a ventricular septal defect. Now, when we're talking about septal defect, we're talking about the septum. That's the wall between the two ventricles of the heart, between the right and the left ventricles of the heart. There's a wall there that's called the septum. Between the two atria of the heart, there's a wall there that's the septum. So often there can be a little hole in that wall. It didn't close all the way or maybe there was a problem that opened up this little hole in between those two chambers of the heart. And when that happens, blood, instead of flowing where it's supposed to flow, it flows through this hole and it goes where it's not supposed to flow at which point the heart isn't functioning as well as it otherwise should be. And if that hole gets too big, that can cause a lot of problems. A lot of people live with just little holes, and there's maybe a little bit of fl blood flowing where it's not supposed to. But if that hole gets real big, then they start to have a lot of problems. So we can go in there and do surgery and close that hole and get the blood flowing where it's supposed to. Now, sometimes instead of there being a hole between, say, two chambers of the heart, there can be a hole between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Now, these two vessels are usually real close to each other. They're sitting next to each other. And sometimes you can get a case where they don't really separate fully. So there's a little hole between them, a little duct connecting the pulmonary artery with the aorta. This is called a patent ductus arteriosus. Now, if you break that down, it kind of makes sense. Arteriosus, we're talking about arteries here. Ductus, we're talking about a little duct between these two arteries. And patent, remember what patent means? That means fluid can flow from one place to another through the lumen. So it's patent, it's able to flow through. So a patent ductus arteriosus is a little duct that connects one artery to the next. To fix this, we're just going to close that little duct off and let the blood flow where it otherwise should. A coarctation of the aorta. This is a condition that we'll sometimes see in children because the aorta didn't expand. It didn't develop fully. So what happens is you get a little stricture, a narrowing of the aorta. And the way we'd notice something like this is usually the patient's going to have very high blood pressure in their arms and very low blood pressure in their legs. Well, why would that happen? Well, if you have a stricture, a narrowing of the aorta, and all the blood's going to the arms and very little blood is going to the legs, then you're going to see high blood pressure in the arms and low blood pressure in the legs. So that's how we know we have that little narrowing in there. And we can go in there and either try to stretch it out, or if it's real severe, we can cut it out and anastomose the aorta together. 
And one last condition that we'll often see in children is actually a combination of four different conditions. It's known as the tetralogy of phallant. Now, tetralogy, tetra, we're talking about four. So we have four different conditions going on. And these four conditions include things like right ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular septal defect, which we talked about, pulmonary stenosis, and an overriding aorta. All of these things can, that can really restrict and block blood flow from going where it normally should. So this is going to be a fairly significant surgery. We're going to go in and fix all four of these conditions because often these four conditions are going to happen all together together in one patient. So I know that was a lot. Thank you for listening to this cardiac surgery preview. I really enjoy this stuff. And I know, hold on, I like the vascular stuff too. So the next chapter is also going to be a big one.